Hello, this is Robin Harford from Plants and People podcast, eatweeds.co.uk and foragingcourses.com. I am here in a room with the Seed Sisters. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Would you like to introduce yourselves? I'm Fiona. I'm Belle. And I'm Karen. And we're part of a collective of herbalists known as Sensory Solutions. Herbal Evolution. And we're... um, we're trying to connect people with nature and plants in the hope that it will empower them to take charge of their own health and that of their families and their friends. So plants being of these aisles or f- yeah, foreign we're, ones? We're, foreign ones. Foreign ones. We're particularly invested in connecting people with their local plants because we believe that if you go outside and take a walk, all of the plants that you and your family need grow within walking distance of your home. And as you start to recognise the importance and the interconnectedness we all share with nature, it brings this empowerment and encourages us all to protect the earth from greed and violence. And I think that the word native is um, something that's a funny one in the plant world, isn't it? Because we've got so many things that are imported or that are really easy to grow here. And what we're about is either growing your own herbs and um, or going out and harvesting them from wherever that may be. Some of the herbs that we use are from the pond margins of stately homes, for example. And okay. they've been imported from India, the Calamus sweet sure. flag root, for example. So, and One of the herbs we're going to talk about today is the chilli, which is easy to grow at home. Yeah. yeah. So we're looking at cultivated plants as much Natural. as wild plants, just plants. Plants, naturalised, native, local or easy to grow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Right, okay. That's a narrow margin. Yeah. yeah kind of. <laughs> Honed it in. Yeah, it cuts down a few. Possibly. <laughs> well, when we look at it, you can say that nettle isn't a native plant because the Romans have brought the nettle over. But they've been naturalised here, haven't they? <laughs> ooh, I would... Ooh, <laughs> we're not going to get into the history on that one. <laughs> Controversial, straight out the door. I'd just like to say that Seed Sisters is... The sisters bit is S-I-S-T-A in a circle S. That's right. That's a bit provocative. <laughs> we have those to. in the know will know what that means. But for those who don't know one earth and A in a circle and obviously weren't... Around at the times that I was a youngster. Well, not Atkinson trucks. <laughs> <laughs> no. We um we believe in freedom. We believe in self governance, and we connect those particular values to anarchy. Yeah, good. So more of the radical herbalism. The radical herbalism, yeah. yeah. Getting back into the earth, getting our hands dirty, and not buying things from a shelf. Not having that divorce from nature that is so prevalent today where you can walk into a health food shop and quite arrogantly buy a load of different herbs that you don't know who's picked them, you don't know where they've come from. We're trying to get people back into connecting with their own herbs themselves. We're really interested in putting herbal medicine back in people's hands. That's really cool, yeah. Because so much of... of it seems the herbal Jewish. I was speaking with a group of herbalists the other day, and everyone was talking about wouldn't it be great to have a have a UK herbalist conference? And it was kind of like, well, it's just never going to happen because there's so many factions. There's those who want to keep it in the elites and the cliques, and then there's the community herbalists like yourselves who want to open it up to everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's really exciting times for herbal medicine because. A herbal medicine hasn't become statutory regulated, which means that people are free to explore different ways of learning herbs, whereas five, ten years ago, the main uh, route in was through the university model. Even though there's always been lay herbalists and people learning, if you were interested in plants but didn't know where to go to study it, you were usually found your way towards the degree programme. And now that regulation hasn't occurred in that way, there's amazing courses popping up all over the place. 
ours included, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, where people can come and actually hands-on connect with the herbs, um, connect with others, and there's these amazing networks of people. It's so diverse, herbal medicine. I think it's really important to celebrate that people are coming from different angles, and we've got the radical herb gathering, and we've got more mainstream herbal gatherings, and and it's it's all there's space for all of it as yeah. long as it's getting herbs out there and and can attract people from different walks of life then there's there's space on this earth for us all so. yeah all wheels different wheels in the sorry different spokes in a wheel yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. christopher much. headley once called herbal medicine a broad church yeah and we were very inspired by christopher and he actually was the spark that ignited mm -hmm. Sensory Solutions, our company, and right. the way we work. Right. Great. It is great. And today we wanted to focus on a particular potion. We wanted to focus on passion potion and okay. talk to you about the herbs. But Fiona and I met on a degree course at Middlesex University 20 years ago. And <laughs> and of, as part of that course, we hung out together, hiding from the serious scientific fraternity <laughs> and played in it the field. Was, well, I I'm not sure that we could hide away from it because it was the course, but we, we had to counterbalance it with playing in fields with plants with each other and um, yeah, because on that flooring on that four year degree course. There was one herb walk. That's outrageous. It is outrageous. That is outrageous. <laughs> I get, I do get a number of people in my own course who've done the university degree route, and they they're just gobsmacked because they come and they go. You know what? I've been, I've done all this training, and I I treat clients, and I don't know what these plants look like. I've never touched them outside of a dried mass in a bag or in a jar that yeah. was at the university. They don't even. Which is just like bonkers to me, completely mm, bonkers. It is bonkers. But hey-ho. Both of us were quite blessed because we'd been working with the plants prior to the degree. And throughout the degree, we connected and we, we made our own medicines. Mm. So throughout the course, we were out there. And one of the most incredible um, experiences we had at the beginning was with Daisy. We, were, we did yoga together at a centre and outside was a lawn covered in those beautiful white and pink blooms and yellow blooms and we spent quite a few hours playing with the daisy and getting engrossed in, in kind of driving our fingers through the flower heads and pop 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 listening to it and finding out that daisy is fairy and predictive text when we were texting <laughs> we can't come back we're picking fairies <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't a herb that we'd been taught about or that's even written about in many of the materia medicas and we just we knew it was part of the daisy family and we used other things like calendula and the asteraceae family also known as Compositae, <laughs> yes. massive family. So we were like, okay, you know, it tastes good, it tastes safe, it, it, you know, it doesn't. So we knew there must be something in its medicine, but we didn't know what at that stage. And um, so harvesting it all was our first experiences of connecting and going in with that completely. I, I, I nearly said blank mind, but. <laughs> <laughs> with new eyes yeah. was um was incredible because we were able to just get into the plant and see what it wanted to tell us and it <laughs> it was our first proper experience of um being spoken to by the herbs that sounds a bit odd i guess just for some listeners who might think this is kind of going a bit out there mm -hmm. which um it isn't uh, <laughs> well, when, it is when, when 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 in the herbal community, there is this there is this um, belief or exper certainly experience, certainly on my behalf, whereby plants do somehow communicate something. Mm -hmm. What what is that, and and in what way does it manifest for you? So when Daisy suddenly started talking to you, you know. Okay, so we were picking the daisy, and we had to be in the car at two thirty to be able to pick my son up from school. So maybe it was. Two o'clock, we've started picking. At 2.25, there was still an entire meadow of daisies left and we needed to pick those. 
They needed to be picked. There was a compulsion that both of us had. We went back to the car to try and leave. We looked out the window and went, just five more minutes, we could be a bit late for Harry, it'll be okay. And we were back in that field picking. And this compulsive urge, it was as though the daisies were calling us saying, you need more, you need more. Yeah. And yes, they didn't speak to us in words, but we felt this magnetic pull and this compulsion to do more and more. And it was so um, pleasurable being on our knees in a spring meadow, feeling these little fairies' heads pop into our fingers. <laughs> that it was like, like a drug, I suppose, like some kind of um, addictive, compulsive mechanism kicking in. And you should have seen how many daisies we had that year. We had we had baskets full, and there were still thousands left in this yeah. meadow. And I think it was about recognising the symbolism. And whether that's imagination, whether it is the herbs actually talking to you, if you can ascertain the information that you need to from that, it kind of doesn't matter what your beliefs are. Because we... In that moment, we were like, OK, maybe there's something in this about compulsive behaviour, something that you okay. feel a draw towards doing that you can't step away from. And when we went back, we looked at Dr Edward Back's writing about the back flower remedies, Bellis Perennis, its Latin name, um, because the herbals don't talk about, often don't talk about emotional connections um, and we found his writing and homeopathic writings very useful for trying to build up a picture about who specific herbs might be useful for. And in his writing about Bellis, he was saying, um, great for repeated patterns of behaviour okay. that you can't break out of. And we were like, <gasps> <gasps> ah! Oh, we got it, we got it. We jumped around the house for hours going, yeah, we could be gods. <laughs> <laughs> what a freeing, amazing thing to know. Yeah. You know, when you get a message and then... You... It's backed up by something mm. someone else has said. Yeah. It's like, no, oh, I, we're I, talking the same yeah, language here. Yeah. It's okay. Validation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the word. But I think for people that it does sound far out for, there's also very um, physical ways to tap into that language through the tastes, for example. You know, people are used to tasting things, whether it's wine or food or bitter salad mm -hmm. or... And the more you get to know that different flavours can indicate different actions within the herbs, um, then you can start to unpick a language through through that as well. So, so the for, daisies... Yes, yeah, for example, with the daisies, when you make a tea, with the, what we did with all those daisies, we took them home, we brewed up a strong decoction with them. So we put them into a pan, covered them in water, boiled them and simmered them. And then as we poured... Just the daisy flower. Just, just the, the daisy, daisy flower. Okay. Then as we poured that liquid off, straining the daisy flower out of the liquid, it got a frothy head like a beer. And that frothy head was showing us about the saponins. Mm. And when you tasted it, it tasted soapy. And because we were studying herbal medicine at the time, we understood that saponins will have a direct action on lung tissue, for example, okay. and be expectorant. So we knew that what we had made had, was full of saponins, tasted soapy and had an expectorant action. So we knew it was going to have this natural affinity for the lungs. It was going to um, help with repeated patterns of behaviour or compulsions. We knew it was in the same family as the calendula, so we wondered about its lymphatic properties. Mm -hmm. And also the same family as arnica, and we'd read mm -hmm. that yes. it's on native bruise work. That's what I'd heard. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That, so that it could be used for that as well. And actually the saponins are said to help um, break down coagulated blood that causes the bruising under the skin. Right. Um, so you're getting this direct action in that way as well. So we started to build up a profile of Daisy, but the overriding effect was that it was fun and playful yeah. Yeah. and yeah. joyful to be out yeah. there picking it. And when you stand on the daisies walking through the meadow and you look back, they bounce back they up. They bounce back, yeah. And that maybe. showed us about a gift of resilience. And, you know, when you get knocked down, you can get up again. Emotional yeah. bruising as well as the physical. Yeah, the Physical yeah. giving a link and to the emotional. And then Chumbawamba wrote that song at the same <laughs> time. <laughs> <laughs> it 
<laughs> get up again. That was about Daisy. <laughs> so we were like, everybody needs this herb, you know, and we'd made so much of it that we had millions of it to share. Wonderful. We made syrup. So we, made we, took syrup. That, yeah. we took that liquid with that frothy head and we went to Mrs Greaves, who has a fantastic book called The Modern Herbal. Yeah. And she said to make a syrup, you use a pound of sugar to a pint of liquid. So we went to the shop and we got our fair trade organic <laughs> unprocessed sugar and we made so much daisy syrup that we had to buy a second-hand American fridge to, to keep it in all the in. Wow. <laughs> we had gallons You don't do things in moderation, do you, folks? No, it's not a daisy concert. <laughs> we got overexcited <laughs> and, and joyous. But we were like, OK, well, if the daisy's talking to us, she's obviously telling us that she needs to be in as many people as possible sharing her joy because we've got so much of it. So we set about putting it into a potion, which we created as actually as a party potion to go out. Um, yeah, we were going out to a gig and we thought, let's make up some herbs because we, we don't drink alcohol when we're well, out it was about. like It was like it was like a DJ from Zion Train or something, wasn't it? Like yeah. really, but, you know, heavy bass music yeah. in a really small room in the back of a pub. And we just, we, we weren't drinking and we just wanted to go out and have a good time, you know, have some sort of, slight altered consciousness experience but without injuring ourselves yeah. mentally or emotionally in any way yeah. so we put a potion together with the daisy and valerian root and chili and we called it dragon's breath at the time oh yeah we did yeah because we were <laughs> reading <laughs> and playing around with the archetypes of the um woman that's needs rescuing and then the man comes along and slays the dragon and we were just like oh that's a load of bollocks anyway and yeah. we like dragons and how can we who says she wanted to be saved <laughs> yes. from the dragon <laughs> <laughs> she might have run off with him in the first place yeah. she might want to go around flying on her dragon's back <laughs> <laughs> so we went out for a night of dancing in St Albans to this little club and we just we put them in little dropper bottles and we went and gave everybody you in the club... were dosing the dance floor. We <laughs> dosed the dance floor. Um, unbeknown to us what was about to occur, <laughs> though. <laughs> because suddenly it was really heavy bass, really dark, and there was half-naked people because they were hot. The chilli sure. drove everyone yeah. to stripping off, so there's, like, lots of writhing bodies dancing <laughs> to bass <laughs> on dragon's breath Excellent. and we realized that it was getting a bit freaky because there was all these like young men <laughs> coming wanting more of the potion and and getting quite fruity with us and we were like what have we done <laughs> it's a passion potion it's not a party potion it's ignited wow, this desire really? wow and um and we changed the name to Passion Potion. Well, well, apart from that, people didn't really get Dragon's <laughs> Breath. They were like, was oh, it going to give me Dragon's Breath? What's <laughs> but we went on to have so. a few seasons, because we tour the festivals, so we take a little um, 1960s Airstream, those Silver Bullets American Airstreams, and we went around various music festivals and craft festivals over the summer, and we spent a few summers taking Passion Potion to... Um, to kind of keep us going and we just put it out there into the world and we had many fantasies around what Passion Potion would bring. We did, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a very... But, but what we realise is that as well as igniting your passions is something about the flow of creativity mm. with it. And um, people are often shocked that we use valerian in there. Yeah. Um, because it's it's become known, this is a tincture Bell made at the weekend of um, valerian. Nice. So it's got valerian roots chopped up and then vodka poured over the top. And um, valerian's become very fashionable or trendy for um, sleep. Yeah. So that's what people mainly know it for as a sedative. So they're often shocked that we have it in a party, in a passion potion. But again, another thing we realised when we went to the old herbals about valerian is that it's traditionally been used as an aphrodisiac. 
And while Valerian on its own working with it didn't tell us that, within the context of the Passion Potion, we knew it was acting right. in that way. Yes, it had the endorphin, spicy, chilli vibe, but it had this relaxing, opening quality of the Valerian. So the Valerian is quite a hot herb um, when you take it internally. It dilates your blood vessels, so it has this ability to open and relax um, your central nervous system and your blood vessels and that coupled with the circula circulatory action of the chilli pushes things to all of your extremities so heightens your senses and it also has a coupled action of taking away inhibitions so you feel hot and sensuous and relaxed and uninhibited and then you overlay that with daisy, which brings you joy and playfulness. playfulness. And you have a recipe for passion and intensity of experience. So okay. like MDMA? Yes, if you want to liken it to a, <laughs> to a chemical. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, yeah, you know. It, yeah. And I do have to state, former drug addict here, no longer <laughs> using for the last few years. Um, but interested yes. in the states that when I was using drugs that it would would kind of get me into and therefore other ways that are wholesome, um, wholesome in the sense of being not destroying your mind or your, or your body mm -hmm. um, that we can use with other plants without necessarily getting high from them but still experiencing the loved upness, say. Yeah, and, exactly. That. And this is something that we are very interested in promoting because... Um, we see a lot of people, and having come through it ourselves, moving away from chemicals doesn't mean that you don't want to connect with your friends or um, or with the oneness of the universe just because you stop doing chemicals. And what there is when you get into the plant world is this whole world of perception-altering plants that actually... That quality can be found in any plant, just about any plant sure. that you approach. Sure. And um, so there's this this whole world to explore and almost replace in a much more wholesome, healthy way. So people do like to understand the qualities, like does it relate to the feeling of MDMA? But in our experience, it's kind of a whole lot more because there's so many different compounds within each plant and mixing them together. And if you take them over a period of time, you really start to experience a lasting effect that yeah. carries on into your life rather than a high and, and then a low. Yeah. 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 And on that note of working with people on with substances, we were once invited to a festival that was particularly debauched there was a lot of young people on ketamine there right and we found ourselves in the center of the festival feeling quite um barricaded in by this yeah. sea of munters with our space mm. where we take herbs and have a first aid station for herbs and try and teach people about plants and run workshops that's why we were in the middle of the festival <laughs> <laughs> and we were trying to work out because recently I'd been to a talk that someone had given about the use of iboga in mm -hmm. heroin addiction. Mm -hmm. So we were looking at these ketamine um, corpses. corpses around, thinking... Because the ideology that I'd listened to was that iboga speaks to the spirit of opium and they have a conversation and work out, work out some way of leaving the human out of it. Yeah. So we were looking at these ketamine corpses and thinking, right, what plant have we got that will speak to the spirit of K? And what is the spirit of K? Yeah. Because if you've ever seen anyone that's on ketamine, it's it's like a zombie, a zombie state. It's where, an anaesthetic. Yeah, it's an yeah. anaesthetic yeah. that was used originally for horses, um, and it's it's strong and powerful, and it's like. They might be having this journey internally, but it's like no one's at home sure. looking at people. So we were wondering what herb could have the power to cut through that and talk to them. And we had some chilli tincture in the caravan that we use as another 
one of the tinctures as the base for the passion potion. So we thought, well, chili's going to definitely wake them up because you can't ignore chili. And maybe we should drop chili tincture in their eyes because they were just lying. <laughs> this was our thought process. <laughs> but then they'd wake up. No yeah, shit. <laughs> So we were discussing this in our creative fears yeah. and we thought, well, we better try it on ourselves first because it's not very fair to no, go sure. around without experimenting on the self. But we did forget that we were covered in glitter all over our eyes and I wear contact lenses and we dropped 45% alcohol chilli tincture in our eyes <laughs> which we had wanted to do for a while because we'd met a herbalist in the lake district years uh, before who treated cataracts in that way wow and we just were, we were quite intrigued. in awe about yeah. her heroic measures and it was intense there was no way you were going to ignore it <laughs> <laughs> it was full on. and it was amazing because my eyes did feel after you know the initial yeah. pain and trauma for an hour or two um they did feel very clear Wow. But okay. we um we actually didn't go out and try it on all the didn't those stalks no. no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's still a work in progress. <laughs> it is a work in progress. But the chili is is the third ingredient and we grow the chilies um and we've grown a whole host of different chilies and then we chop up the fresh chilies and put them in a jar and cover them with brandy and leave that for a lunar cycle, strain off the chilies, and then you're left with the liquid being your chilli tincture. I mean, straining off the the alcohol of a chilli tincture is something to take great care with. Mm. It's not like you can just squeeze them out with your bare hands and then carry on with your normal life, because the chilli is so strong. Wow. And um, so, yes, yeah, if you it, touch your face or if you go to the toilet, sure. anything like that. Yeah. So it demands care and respect, you know, talking about those kind of subtle messages. Chili's not so subtle with its messages. Sure, <laughs> sure. Mm-hmm. So if you didn't want to use alcohol, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. being part of the sobriety is hipster yeah. movement. Mm-hmm. Um, you could do syrups. Syrups. We've used syrups. Vinegar. You can use vinegars, glycerites, powders, okay. infusions. There's Great. a whole host of different way balms, oils. A, vin- a vinegar, a chili vinegar, um, would would be nice to use in this particular concoction, and then possibly like the glycerin for the. And um, some of our valerian. students have experimented with making valerian oil, and then applying yeah. that topically, and then you'll get the same. Okay. Vasodilating properties. Yeah. Mm. So we use uh, mainly uh, the daisy and then valerian in slightly smaller quantities and then um, the chilli just as a little topper because it's so powerful. But we make sure that every drop is, is packs a powerful punch so people really are, um, even if they... Um, do use alcohol they're getting very tiny amounts so minimal effects for the liver in terms of the alcohol Um, it was interesting just to go on a complete different tangent Mm -hmm. um, I was speaking to a friend a couple of days ago who's working in the herbal medic tent in Standing Rock Mm -hmm. they don't have any alcohol tinctures They're, they're kind of not allowed I haven't gone I didn't want to find out why but um and I remember when Seven Song was over, he was talking about his time in the Calais refugee camp, when it was, mm-hmm. um, that obviously, you know, they didn't, weren't able to use alcohol tinctures because mm-hmm. most of the people were Muslim. Um, so, yeah, it's, in, it's important to realise that you don't just have to use alcohol as a tincture, you can have these Definitely. other, other yeah. processes for working with the plants. Yeah. For those yeah. who are sensitive to alcohol. Yeah. yeah. And, it's, um, and for children as well, it's yeah. really nice to um, use infusions with children and they're just as powerful. And in fact, making a regular infusion puts you in contact with the base herb a lot more anyway. And we've got into using powders. Okay. Recently, we've been making... A few years ago, there was a lot of um, confusion with it in our company because the European Union passed um, the Traditional Herbal Medicines Directive. 
And at the time, Fee and I ran a market stall, so we sold all of our herbal remedies. The laws changed and said that all of our remedies needed to be licensed yeah. because they are medicines. So we started to explore the loopholes and the ways round. Yeah. And one of them was food. So ah, okay. you know, things like artichoke or rose hips. Yeah. Or nettles. Or net- nettles. Things that have been known to be food in in this in Europe for a long time. So we began to work with powdering and getting people to add powders to their smoothies. Yeah. And it's a really nice way to take herbs because you're taking the whole herb, whereas with the tinctures or the glycerites or the um, vinegars, you're taking the, the herb away. Sure, sure. Yeah. And also things like um, a sort of chai idea, but with whichever herbs or roots you want to use. So valerian boiled... Um, up in water to quite a kind of concentrated dose and then I mean we use almond milk um, or oat milk that we make poured onto that with you know a bit of chilli boiled up in it like you would um, and then your daisy syrup to actually sweeten it yeah and that's a really lovely powerfully aphrodisiac um, passion promoting drink that everyone can collectively share from as well right. so that's often something that we do take to even just parties in people's houses or events where um it's really nice to bring something to offer you can mm. you can make a big pot of something that everyone can have a cup full out of and then everybody's also getting on that collective vibe vibe yeah 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 sure which is what you were saying about the party uh, the that we took the passion potion to did we dose everyone up and it is what we like to do so that everyone <laughs> comes into the same yeah. the same rhythm and we do um, believe that it's um something that is lacking from society in general today passion yeah people are deadened people are half alive and we're not just talking about sex we're yeah. talking about passions and tapping into what really makes people's hearts sing and how we can just open up to the mystery of it all. And, you know, often we're the first on the dance floor trying to get everyone up and moving. And it's such a shame that human culture's got to this point, especially in the UK, you can see it, where people are just so reserved and so quiet and so away from from themselves. Yeah, unless they take a drug. Yes. Often, which is... Um, which is Well, as people have more alcohol, they tend to get up and dance. But yeah. that initial bit, you think, well, you've missed half the night. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Come on. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it is. We it's do... epidemic in that sense, mm-hmm. I find, within the culture. I mean, as someone who's, you know, so part of the sober is hip community, it's... it's re- in the early days, it was really quite hard because it's like, well, when I go out... It's okay, I can hang out in people who are drinking cultures or stoner cultures for a while, not because I'm going to be tempted, but just the vibe is there. And then the vibe goes, it shifts. Mm. It's just like, you know, I'm actually just on such a different, in such a different place, Mm. I don't say different level, but in a different place, that I can't actually start communicating. That's and so we, that's when I that's have to when remove we go myself. To bed. Yeah. <laughs> so we need to have a good dance from the beginning. Exactly. So that, <laughs> yeah. So we've yeah. had a good time. Yeah, but it, like you say, you know, I remember listening to a party of um, my parents uh, years ago. I was away about 500 yards in a house and it was all really subdued. And then as the evening went on mm-hmm. and the alcohol flowed, it got louder and louder. Mm. It's like, well, wouldn't it be nice if people could just click into that mm. without having to go through the palaver of getting pissed out of their brains, basically? Mm-hmm. Um, and if they could click into it with um, a conscious awareness and a deep connection with the earth. Because, you know, the last weekend we were on our apprenticeship course and we were making valerian tinctures with everybody. But before that, we had the valerian root out on all the tables We were chewing it, people were chopping it, and the energy and the vibe in the room was quite hysterical almost at one point. Lots of giggles. Lots of giggles, lots and lots of um, words not coming out correctly because you're intoxicated from the smell of the valerian. Before it went, and then it went really mellow afterwards. It was like this wave, but everybody was on it together. 
on this wave together and it was really lovely mm. it was like and knowing people, the plant being in the garden yeah. seeing the plant as it was uprooted and you know so knowing that this vibe and this energy is coming from this particular yeah. spirit yeah is um it's special it's magical <laughs> so what's where's the the um sedative side because that's like the counterpoint isn't it where's the where is the this kind of myth that valerian is oh, it's sedative in, and it's in there and i think once everything relaxes if you're um it's a very individual herb so people act in different ways to valerian for a start but i think depending on what action you're looking for in it it can provide and sometimes you know that thing of you're overworked you're overworked and then you have a holiday and it all comes out and you yeah. make so there's something in valerian i think if it just relaxes and opens to that point where you just go actually i really need to sleep <laughs> if i relax that's what's what i'm going to do but if you go out and you're taking it and you're using it to release inhibitions and to open up and there's just a slightly different intention in its use and yeah. also if people are highly anxious in their natural lives if there's a high anxiety state that's where valerian can be very useful because yeah. it can help to take away those anxieties mm. and sedate because that is what often keeps people really tense and unable to relax but with all of the herbs there's this myth um you know you get herb books and it says dandelion root for the liver or yeah. <laughs> valerian to make you sleep or cam yeah it doesn't work like that because no, it's so that's seeming like drugs isn't it yeah and that i mean it, this is a for me it's an important aspect of herbalism that often you know it it's too trite you see people on facebook oh what's good for eczema you know exactly. and it's like, but it's like yeah. i remember interviewing simon mills you know he said that you know i've had a hundred eczema patients or patients with eczema and every single one has been given a different yeah. mixture mm. of, of plants mm. and so that idea of going into holland and barrett and going oh i've got eczema and they go yes well this pills that that's mm. like going into a chemist and saying, oh, I've got eczema, what's cortisol mm, I yeah. can use? And it's not. It's like missing 75% mm -hmm. when you see plants as a drug mm. or as, as in a pharmaceutical. Yeah. It's a totally different... And, and that, you know, and that's it with valerian. There is one aspect to it that is sedative. But, you know, if you take it for cramps, like period pains, for example because it's being utilised to relax those muscles, somehow it's got less of its sedative effect and more of its muscle relaxing. And, you know, it's just these subtleties and the different effects, and they're so complex, each herb. Mm. It's not it's not linear yeah. with them. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, lovely herbs. But we use this combination, the passion potion, with our patients to ignite their passion for life. Yeah. Um, so if people have become quite cold in their terrain, in their their bodies, there's not a lot of movement, um, they maybe don't have much interest where they might have once, you can use the Passion Potion in small drops on a daily basis over a period of time to help promote that circulation, enliven the spirits, boost people up and... Um, and it's incredible watching the magic take place with it. That's really interesting because I sit in recovery rooms every week. And one of the, the kind of key things that people often experience is, you know, when we've been using alcohol or, or other drugs to quite extreme levels, you know, that kind of passion with fake passion was there. And then when you stop using you're faced with this thing of like there's a flatness mm -hmm. often and i know people who've been clean for years who still have a flatness they haven't got their passion they they, they don't know their focus and it it would be quite in, i'm very interested in in plant medicines for people in recovery mm -hmm. for lots of things like anxiety you mentioned that's a classic mm -hmm. one you know ptsd is a major most addicts former addicts have ptsd or have experienced trauma in some form so all these ways that we can use plants in um other than just for beauty you know which okay obviously has its place but it's a little bit trite really when yeah. we're putting mm -hmm. oh plants are really cool for your eye you know making your eyes look pretty it's like well 
actually, you know, there's some serious plants can be used for serious, serious human conditions. Um, yeah, and what we're what we're you know stating and underpinning all of it with is that yes, we make the passion potion and we use it in these ways, but the way we see real shifts is by connecting the individuals with the plants in it so that they can create their own remedies and potions. Because that that flatness and that the flatness you're talking about comes in some part from spirit. It comes in some part from each individual's spirit and the the connection um the personal connection with the herb is where I see the spirit reignite. And it's not about taking something that you're divorced from. Yeah. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, the passion potion is amazing. It can begin those steps, but there's more to it. Yeah. It's not just it's not taking a bottle off a shelf. Sure, sure. There is no, there's no, I don't believe, I don't think any of us believe that it's all in a bottle. Yeah, no, because, there's got to be that relationship. Yeah. I remember being in, um, when I was in Africa, I was sitting around a fire with a, with a woman um, from the local village and she was, she was recognising her community as being incredibly strong and a powerful, a powerful woman um, with a lot of mysteries that she would teach the younger girls um, who were becoming women. And I talked to her about, you know, plant medicines and, and their worldview and, and how they work with them. And it was, it was, she was very definite when I said, you know, well, some plant medicines just don't work, do they? You know, I was playing devil's advocate. Well, sometimes they don't work, actually. But what's the reasoning behind that, you know, and going on and she's saying that you you know you really have to reach this you have to the spirit of the plant has to enter you as much as the physical aspect and often that going in getting a bottle of the shelf is dealing with just the physical side but actually there is that and that that spirit spirit side comes through from i from my understanding and my belief from from relationship from actually like you say hands-on yeah getting connected so i mean when i was talking about you know helping people in recovery that is getting them outside getting their hands in the soil exactly. and the earth yeah. playing with plants using all that funky stuff um that's it just on on a mental well-being side that's 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 great for people but when you start actually really working with plants and sussing out which ones are working for you you know which ones do you get more attracted to like you say there's that kind of magnetic pull sometimes mm-hmm. um although compulsion for daisy but there is a, a drawing you know a, a kind of one well, being drawn to this plant or it's just hanging around me all the time yeah um so it's a composite it is composite and what's happened with us is that we've got this we've got these relationship with these plants so when we collect them when we co-create with people we work with intention so from the point where we put the seed from our mouths into the earth, there's an intention of how we're working with the plant. When we create tinctures or teas or glycerites or vinegars or powders, there's an intention of what we'd like this plant to be a vehicle for. And we are using our potions as a vehicle for social change. And that's the really important message. And Passion Potion is a vehicle for creating social shifts. We want to agitate society and flip it on its head because we don't think that it's working. We don't think that the connection to the earth is being celebrated the way that it could be. And um, and we are going to change the world, aren't we? High <laughs> <laughs> five, everyone. Come on, Robin, you're doing it too. And Belle, because <laughs> uh, it needs changing. And, and that is each potion that we make at different times has taken us on a journey to realise where certain things are lacking within ourselves and then within society that's obviously a reflection of that and you know with the passion it was about oh it's a passion potion but not just about as we said the sexual passion it's about the enlivening the passions and with drops of love that we make it's about self-nurture and um, and the need to look after ourselves, which is what's often forgotten in society. Sure. And our recovery remedy is a representation of the hedgerow and the idea of creating strong resistance with our brothers and sisters and, and, and recovering and uh, restoring and nurturing ourselves. And 
each potion that we have has this this physical effect, emotional effect, and also the hope that that will trickle out in a much bigger way. And if we can teach people how to make those potions, which is what we're doing, and which is what you're talking about, connecting with the herbs, then that just perpetuates and filters out. And that is our intention with these potions, is that it gets on out there yeah. and does does the work for us once once they're out there. Yeah. So with our courses and everything that we do, we're we're teaching people exactly as you're saying, connecting with the herbs. Yeah. Which is what you're doing and and finding their own way with it. Well we'll get on to where people can find out more. I just want to bring Belle in because mm. Belle, you did this really cool pilgrimage yeah. in Cornwall with the seeds. Can you tell us that? Because I think this is something for people who are listening, this is something I'd I would love people to do. I think mm. it's just just explain explain it because it's it's just really cool. Well, um I was invited to be part of an exhibition that was about the St Michael's Way, which is a path that runs from the north to the south coast of Cornwall, um along what would have been uh, the old trade route. So the coastline would have looked different and the the distance between the north and south coast would have been much shorter and so Goods used to be carried across land when ships didn't want to go round Land's End. Um, and I, um, the time of year was September, and so I decided that I wanted to make the walk along the path about seeds um, in sensory herbalism, which is what we, the way that we practice, we associate um, the autumn with seeds and seed medicine. And we're also working against the backdrop of um, where we're at in agriculture and our food system and um, bioengineering, where we have, you know, terminator seeds being sold to farmers that don't regenerate a huge loss of biodiversity that's particularly affected by monocrop agriculture. And so harvesting and saving and planting our seeds is absolutely imperative. And so I did the pilgrimage collecting the seeds of all the medicinal plants that I found along the way. Wow. How many did you find? There were over 30 medicinal plants. um, I think there were about 35. These are wild medicinal plants. Wild, just growing along the path. Um, And obviously it's... Um, you know, nature isn't tidy, so <laughs> it's a lo- it's a bit of a longer term project than just that one walk because um, not all the seeds are ready on that one day. But sure. I I gathered over thirty five sets of seeds, and then I'm looking to you know obviously plant them. And so coming in the spring, we'll see what happens. So this is planting in your own gardens or just kind of guerrilla gardening and well, you know, it's a, guerrilla growing really, <laughs> growing gardening? It was a really um, great journey for me personally as well because it made me realise that we plant and grow the herbs but um, seed saving and reusing seeds is actually a skill that is not taught very much that we don't necessarily know very much about so um, I'm really looking forward to exploring that this spring and seeing where you know if I were to grow these in a garden setting and they're wild plants you know does that work how can we make it work um yeah yeah it's (laughs) funny um I'm always intrigued when we when we try and bring wild plants into our human gardens and try and grow them Um, and to go back to to Africa there's a plant called devil's claw Mm -hmm. that there's a massive illegal trade in it because it's it's in high demand in Europe and it only grows in the wild and what the pharmaceutical companies have done is they try to grow it in their gardens and and in their farms but it loses its medicine and I wonder Mm -hmm. how many plants that would happen too I mean maybe it is just devil's claws the only one on the entire planet I suspect not yeah and and the strength of medicine from the adverse I suppose it the adversity of a plant growing in the wild, it's struggling, therefore mm. it's creating, I mean, f- purely physically, more chemicals. Mm. Um, whereas I, think it's yeah. the, I think it's the same difference between us and wild animals. You know, you lose your instincts. We, we've yeah. been... Um, we, we live in comfortable electricity, hot water, 
everything laid on in the supermarket, so we've lost every natural instinct. And I think that will happen to the plants the same way, that they lose their instinctual power. Mm. But I think that's also to do with observation. You've got to look at how a herb's growing, where mm. it's growing, who it's growing alongside, you know, and bear that in mind when we do either wildcraft or yeah. bring things into our gardens about creating the ideal situation for them. I mean, you take the... Um, you know, you can you can never avoid the weather, for instance, <laughs> thinking about aromatics that have that we have in our gardens here and how aromatics become much stronger in the heat and the sun or the wind and whatever else it might be. But um yeah, if we can emulate some of that. And you met, you, you mentioned guerrilla gardening yourself, you know, and it's we can be vehicles for picking up a seed and dropping it yeah. elsewhere. It doesn't necessarily mean we have to take them into our garden. No, sure. Uh, that's what I was mm. yeah. Yeah. kind of leading to. Mm. I think that's... Um, I just really like the idea of going yeah. on pilgrimages that... One, which connecting us to, to the land where we happen to exist and we find our feet. Mm. Two, it's exploring the plants as we go along. Three, it's seed saving. Mm. And four, it's taking seeds to other parts where and they may the be needed. pilgrimage you know the pace of walking is about going slowly and having the time to consider and pay homage to you know seed it's uh, the source of our life yeah you know absolutely mm-hmm. well right that's been really cool we've got to wrap and pack it unfortunately <laughs> In fact, I'd like to do an entire two-day podcast <laughs> on the seed, with the Seed Sisters. <laughs> and, um, but before we shoot off, can you folks please tell me where can people find you mm-hmm. in the digital sphere? How do they get in touch? We have a website, sensorysolutions.co.uk and we have a Facebook page, Sensory Solutions Herbal Evolution which people can come and join us on. And on our, if you go to our website, you'll see a space to enter your email and you can sign up for our newsletters that have recipes and information about all our courses. Great. Yeah. So also under the where this particular episode of the podcast is, um, there'll be links to all your sites. Lovely. It gets uploaded to YouTube and SoundCloud as well. So it goes into the multiverse so to speak <laughs> hey man the multiverse right okay thanks a lot thank, thank you. you and thanks Robin <laughs>